Dat zijn. Ja. Ja.
All right, guys, let's get started. So, so last lecture we talked about, so last lecture we talked about core optimization. So, uh, the basic idea of core optimization is x point by uh, this figure right here, which I skipped in last lecture, so I'm going to come back and explain this, uh, uh, this workflow for you. So basically, a typical workflow for core optimization inside this kernel is as follows. 
So you have a, a user query specified in SQL, obviously. And that SQL statement is uh, submitted to the query engine and goes through a parser. Uh, in your uh, simple DB assignment, this parser is provided to you by a third party library called the SQL or uh, And then this parser will basically generate what we call a query plan represented by a query plan tree, which you have seen from our discussion on query evaluation. And then that initial query plan are represented by a tree-like structure with relational algebra operators are then submitted to this module called QR Finder. And the QR Finder basically, broadly speaking, we can view a QR Finder having two components. One is what we call the plan generator, uh, the other is called plan cost estimator. So what does each module do? Well, the plan generator will take an input query plan and generate a different representation of the same query, a different query plan for the same query. So a major challenge for a plan generator is really to test what we call plan equivalence or relational equivalence. What that means is given two query plans, represented by relation algebra in a tree-like structure, can you test whether they are equivalent or they are not? If you are able to do that, with some you know, other uh, technical detail I will mention here, you should be able to basically generate many equivalent plans to a single input curve plan. Okay? And then for each plan you have generated, uh, produced by the plan generator, you pass that generated query plan to a cost estimator. The idea is you want to estimate what's the cost associated with executing the input query using this particular plan. Obviously, a naive solution for, course, uh, for this uh, plan cost estimator is to simply execute the input query according to a given query plan. But that defeats the whole purpose of query optimization. If you have already executed the query using a particular plan, what's the point of optimizing the plan space anymore? You already get your query results, right? So the entire query optimization basically boils down to uh, how effective uh, this module can be, meaning how efficient you can estimate uh, the cost associated with the query plan without actually executing the query according to that plan. Okay? And imagine you have a way to do this effectively and efficiently. Effectively means that the cost you have provided, the, the cost estimation you have provided, is fairly accurate. It's not going to be exact because you only know the exact query cost if you execute the query according to that plan, which you won't be able to do. So it will be an approximation. So you hope that estimation to be effective, in other words, to be accurate, but at the same time, you want this to be efficient. Because at the end of the day, when you go through this loop multiple times, why do you have to go through this loop multiple times? Well, maybe the initial plan you have generated is simply too expensive. So you want to try some other plans before you finally settle down to a plan with a reasonable cost. And that's when you basically pass that plan to the queue executor to execute. Okay. And in this process, the plan cost estimator relies on some other modules inside the kernel to do its job. Uh, in, in particular, it relies on what we call the catalog manager that maintains the schema information, which I explained earlier in this course. Right? I show you basically how uh, schemas are stored in, for example, PostgreSQL. Essentially, they are stored just as tables. Okay. And then you have some other what we call uh, statistics you maintain for your table. I will explain later on what those statistics are. And then with those information, you can basically estimate the cost of a given plan and go through this loop multiple times until the system settles down on a plan with reasonable cost. And when that happens, you pass that plan to your executor for final execution. So that's kind of the entire workflow. And the bottom line is, remember, the bottom line is this process right here shall not be too expensive. What do I mean by too expensive? Well, the cost you spend here, the running time you spend here in this loop, plus 
the running time will actually feel great. The total cost of these two steps should be ideally less than if you were to execute your query as it is using whatever input query plan uh, you have from the beginning. Otherwise, this whole thing doesn't make any sense. If you were just executing the query according to the initial query plan, you are better off already. So what's the point of spending all this expensive uh, uh, plan generation and cost estimation and then finally execute your query according to your so-called optimized plan? Uh, there's no point of doing all this, right? So, so the, the overall objective really is to make sure the combined cost of this step and this step must be less than uh, the initial input curve plan. Of course, this we may not be able to guarantee that all the time. Why? Because you may have a really SQL savvy or database savvy person writing the SQL query. <coughs> and if that person knows the structure of your database, like what index you have and so on and so forth, he or she may be able to write the SQL in a particular fashion so that the initial plan is fairly optimized. But your database engine might not be able to realize that until you're going through this loop several times and they realize, oh, the initial plan is not too bad. But by that time, it's too late. Whatever plan you come up with and execute the query according to that, the total cost might be already higher than just executing the query according to the initial plan. That may happen. But the bottom line is, first of all, rarely this may happen in practice, and even when it does happen, the overhead is very small. Meaning, yes, I spend, I end up spending more time than just executing the query according to the initial plan, but hopefully my overhead is not too big. That's because it's only 5% more expensive, even I end up in this worst case scenario. Okay? And furthermore, keep in mind, this worst case scenario typically does not happen. Typically, what you end up with is the query optimizer will be able to find a plan that's much more efficient than you, uh, you, you than executing the query according to the initial plan. Okay. So here are the example we're going to use uh, in our discussion. So rather than going back always to refer to this slide, I'm going to copy down uh, these numbers here on the whiteboard so that we can uh, all kind of uh, reference to the whiteboard when needed. So let me use the space right here. So that So that's what we have, and uh, we also assume okay, buffer pool size is five, okay, five pages. Now, here is a motivating example. So basically, what we do is we uh, write this as query, and our objective is. So the objective is really to see what's the cost of this query if we execute this input query using different query plans. So, so here is the initial attempt. What we do is we use sailors as the uh, alter table. And this is by our discussion on page uh, on the next room. We always use, we should always use the smaller table as the alter relation and the larger table at the inner relation. 
So if you are going to use page armpit as a join, you better just use the smaller table as the author relation, which is what we're doing here. Oh. Then I explained towards the end of last lecture what do we mean by on the fly. Basically, whenever you find a joining pair of joining tuple, when you push that to the output buffer, in the process of doing that, you do the selection and progression on the, on the fly. So in other words, if you find a pair of joining tuples, but they do not satisfy the selection condition, you simply do not push that pair to the output buffer. And if it, if it does satisfy the joint uh, selection condition, when you push to the output buffer, you don't push the entire pair of tuples for the joint, you push only the projected attribute to the output buffer. Okay? So that's what we mean by doing this on the fly. So in other words, <coughs> These two steps incur no additional I.O. because you do that uh, on the fly while you are pushing uh, records to the output buffer. So they incur no additional I.O. <coughs> so what is the cost of this uh, particular plan? Uh, if we do this using page augmented that we join, what we know is we're gonna for each zero page, we're gonna loop through all the <coughs> Pages found on reserve, and at the end of it, we also need to load the sales table once. So we end up with this particular cost. So if we, which is shown by here on the, on the, on the slides, on the other hand, if we push down the selection on the right hand side, if you look at the, the plan on the right hand side, if we push down the selection, what happens? If we push down the selection on sales, and we do that on the fly, and we do assume 50%, uh, oh, sorry, uniform distribution on the rating attribute. So we have 10 distinct rating values, and we assume this uniform distribution on the rating value. What that tells you is this selection, the selectivity is 50%, because you assume uniform distribution, and you are selecting about half of the domain, so you got 50% selectivity. Okay? And if you do this on the fly, what that means? What that means is, while you are loading a page of serious record into main memory buffer, you carry all this selection, and keep only those records satisfy the selection condition. And given the observation that it's, it gives you a 50% selectivity, what that really tells you is, every two page Having two pages of sitters record become only a single page in your main memory buffer. Having two pages of sitter records become a single page in your main memory buffer. Because you're applying the selection on the fly with a selectivity of 50%. Does that make sense? So in other words, when you load a page of sitters record into main memory, about half of them will be eliminated. So a page of sailors record only occupy about half pages in main memory, and you have space to load another page of sailors into the other half of your main memory buffer. And then you carry out the uh, page of next loop as, as before, what you end up with is in this cost. Right? At the end of it, you, you load all the sailor pages once, but you only look through the reserve table for every two sailor pages. So you end up doing the loop over that 1,000 pages only 250 times, rather than 500 times. So using this simple trick, you already reduce the current cost by half. Right? It's already reduced by half. Well, this might inspire you to say, okay, there is also a selection on fold ID. If pushing down the selection on sailors helped me dramatically, can I try pushing down the selection on fold ID as well? I should expect some improvement as well, right? So that gives you another uh, query plan like that on the right hand side, right? You know what happened in this case? Well, we can do the analysis, right? One, one more time, we're going to assume uh, 
uniform distribution on the vote ID in the reserve table, meaning people reserve different votes roughly uh, uniformly. Okay? So when, when you have a selection condition of vote ID equal to 100, and knowing that you have uniform distribution over 100 distinct vote ID values, the selectivity of this is simply what? The selectivity of this query is simply 1%. Okay? It's simply 1%. What that tells you is, this 1,000 pages, the reserve table, will reduce to only roughly 10 pages. 1,000 pages become roughly 10 pages. However, the key observation is, you are still using page-oriented next to join, and you are doing this on fly, which means Yes, it reduces the number of pages participating in the join from 1,000 to 10, but every single time you are still looking through 1,000 pages. So you are still paying this cost of loading 1,000 pages for every two pages of sitter's record. What really matters here is that you have reduced the in-memory next loop join cost <coughs> Once those pages are loaded in memory, in, in the original case, once you have one full page of signal buffer after you apply the selection condition here, and every two page give you an input buffer page, do you have to do the join between this page and every single page from the reserve? Now you don't have to do that. You still have to load all sort of pages. However, you only expect to do a join roughly you know, every 100 pages also. Because every 100 pages also reserve record give you a single page that satisfies the selection condition that you need to uh, carry out the, the in-memory next loop join. So what, what essentially happening here is you have reduced the in-memory next loop join cost. In other words, you reduce the CPU cost by a lot. But in terms of I.O. cost, really it doesn't have any impact whatsoever. So you end up with the same cost. However, this reminds you, what about if we flip the order of the two? In the original page, our team has to join, we said, we said you always want to use the table with a smaller size as alter. So that's why we started with sitter as alter relation. So now, after applying these two selection conditions, you quickly realize, after the selection condition, the reserve table actually is the one with the smaller size, with only 10 pages was it 250 pages. So maybe I should swap the order of the two. So, so that's essentially the plan over there. And if you do the math, what, what's the cost right here? Well, it becomes it become 10, because 1,000 pages become only 10 pages. And for those 10 pages, you need to loop through all similar pages, which is 500 of them. So it becomes 10 times 500. At the end of the day, you have to scan through the reserve table once, which is 1,000 pages. So that's essentially the IO. 10 times 500 plus 1,000 give you about 6,000 IOs. That's a dramatic reduction, as you can tell. That's a dramatic reduction. OK? What well, can we do better? We started with about half million IOs, and we reduced all the way to about only 6,000 IOs. That's almost a hundred times speed up. Hundred times speed up, almost. But by simply uh, looking at different plans. If you think about this, you gonna is I don't have to convince you that this plan generation cost is worth spending, right? By spending a little bit of time over there, generating different plan and estimating the cost, you end up saving hundred times uh, when you actually execute the query according to the initial plan. So definitely this cost is, this overhead is what's paying for, right? Now, the question is, can we do better? Well, we still can, actually, right? in this case. So instead of doing this on the fly, <coughs> for the sitters, right? What about we execute the selection condition? We already, we already realized that if you execute the selection condition on the fly, and using page next to join, it's not going to reduce the I.O. cost, it only reduces the CPU cost. But what if we do not apply the selection condition on the fly, rather we apply the condition, write the output to disk, 
and load it back in for uh, carrying out the page audit in that loop. That's essentially what we're doing there. We scan the status table, apply the selection condition, and write the output to disk, and, and denote that as a temporary relation, and then using that temp table, which we denote as T2, to participate in the following page oriented as we join. What's it, what will be the cost over there? Well, obviously, you have to pay 500 IOs to scan through the sailor table, and you have to write it back to disk. That gives you 250 IOs because the selectivity is 50%. Right? And now you have to do that page oriented as we join. And remember, you, you do this selection condition on board ID on the fly. So, southern pages become essentially only 10 pages for the, in memory, uh, for the, in, uh, for the input buffer in, in your memory. And then for those 10 pages, you need to look through all these pages from T2, this is your T2. At the end of the day, you have to load this southern page once. So that's essentially the cost. That will be essentially the cost. So you got this number right here. Similarly, you can also try flip the order of the two and do that selection on board ID rather than on the fly, but do that selection and write the output to the disk and load it back in. Right? So the cost for that will be this <coughs> plus right? I don't know you have to scan through all those 500 pages once. So that's essentially uh, this plan right here. And the cost, well, you reduced a little bit, not, not by a whole lot, just a little bit. So far, look at what we have done. What we basically are doing is essentially flip the order of the join and also pushing down the selection operator. Selection over one, push down selection over one, and that seems to be a really useful optimization trick, right? So far, what we haven't considered uh, so far is a different join algorithms. Why do we have to stick with page on the join? We can do better than page on. What about hash join? What about uh, server join? What about block nested join? We can use all these different join algorithms rather than always use page nested join. So that's essentially uh, the, the other plan we may consider, right? What if, what if we, for example, the argument say, what if we use uh, external merge store node? So here is basically the breakdown of the query cost with five buffers. We need to scan the reserve table and write to the disk. So that's a thousand read and ten writes. Southern rate and 10 rounds. And we do the same for the sailors, that's 500 rate IOs and 250 write IOs. And then only then we do the right and we do the sorting. So in other words, we do the sorting on the temp table respectively for the regular and sailors. With five pages, you can show that you can sort 10 pages in only two rounds, and you can sort 250 pages in two rounds as well. Are three rounds. So that's essentially uh, the cost for sorting, and then you pay a final cost of linear scan to tables. That's essentially the, 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 the cost for uh, external merge sorting. Right? And in this particular case, we are not able to use the optimized version of sort or join. Why? Because square root of the larger relation size doesn't fit into your memory buffer. We derived that condition before. Right? You need to have that condition in order to uh, use the optimized version of sort of drone, which gives you linear cost three times uh, uh, of three linear scale over the relations. We are not able to do that in this case. So that will be our total cost in the end of the day. 
if we use a lot of Nesman drawing though, instead of doing Sorber drawing right here, so what we end up is we have 10 pages for one table and 250 pages for the other table, and we have five buffers. So what do you do? Well, you, you basically need to do this. Why is this? Why? We have four. Why there's no value four over there? Can someone tell me? Basically, what's the block that we're drawing? Cost for two tables. Right? So that's essentially what I'm asking here. Can someone explain to me? I'll show you the answer there already, right? Can someone tell me why the answer is like that? No? Who else? Can someone help me? <laughs> Do they want to help me out? Okay, I will you know answer this myself, but I will ask another question down the road. Okay. Next time I won't help you with this. Cloud has been drawn. What it does is you reserve one input buffer. Bigger relation that always give you 
better cost at the end of the day. So that's what we're doing here. The block level joint cost for this particular case become, okay, 10 pages. What's the block size, by, by the way, in this case? If my memory size is 5 pages, what's the block size? 3. 3, right? Must be 3, right? So, I think the same of that, that's how many times you have to go through that 250 pages. At the end of the day, you go through the 10 pages. So that's essentially why I got the formula. And then, of course, you have to account for the cost of reading the page, writing to the list, before you do this. So that's the total cost for this plan right here, using block time. And you can also push down production rather than only pushing down selection. You can push down production as well. And how do you push down production? Well, when you push down production, you are not reducing the number of records participating in a join. What you are reducing, however, is the size of each record. And that helps too, because that essentially, in other words, for example, think about what happened here. 500 pages have become 250 pages. But if you push down projection as well, you may end up with much less number of pages as well. You have the same number of records, but you have much less number of pages needed to store those records because each record has now smaller size. The only thing you need to pay attention to is when you do the projection push down, not only you need to push down the projection on that projection attribute, you need to project out all the attributes you need for the join operator. So when you push down the Sailor name to the Sailor's table, not only you need to put out the Sailor's record, you also need to put out the Sailor ID in order for you to perform the join operator. Uh, follow that. Okay? If you have index, you can do even better. And here is the example of this. I'm gonna, by the way, I'm going to skip this slide because this is essentially uh, the same analysis I've been doing but just using a different drawing algorithm. So it's fairly straightforward. I do want to mention in this particular case, one thing I didn't mention in the slides is after you have done this step, the two pages become 250 and 10, right? My buffer size is 5. If you do the math, you can actually, this actually satisfy that condition square root of this must be greater than the smaller size of the two relations, right? Which is, uh, actually, it's, oh sorry, it's, uh, it's not the condition, not this. The condition is, right? And, and it's actually true. Right? Which means you can use the optimized version of hash form, the hash form algorithm, and the total cost is simply what? So you, you don't have to do this, or you can simply do that. And in fact, you can optimize this even further, meaning when you do this on the fly, don't write it to this. You, after you do this selection, you do it on the fly, you go into the hash join phase right away, so you can eliminate one round of writing to this and go them back. So the total cost is simply like this. <coughs> you follow me? And that, I believe, uh, is probably the most optimal plan in this case if you don't consider the index as well. Assuming if you have index, if you don't have index, you don't have this cost. And this is to assume there is a <coughs> Uh, hash of B plus 3 index on one of the joint attributes. Then you can do uh, really well. So using this motivating example, I show you how important it is to do cross validation. I show you uh, how, uh, how important to do cross validation. So in our research, we have done some work I'm going to show you right, right here. So we have extended the typical database engine 
to support spatial query processing, right? This is done by my PT student Don and one of my undergrad uh, research assistant Dilian. Um, over the back end is really a Spark cluster. So it's not a single node at the back end. It's a cluster of machines, about 10 machines right here. And we're using a data set of about 2.2 billion records. So, uh, the, the database size is about 200 gigabytes behind the scene. So what we're essentially using is OpenStreetMap data set. If you haven't heard about OpenStreetMap, you can just Google it. So it's kind of like a Google Maps thing, but it's open source. So people can contribute data, like a point of interest data, as well as row section and so on and so forth. And we download all those data and store that in our database. And we want to answer things like nearest neighborhoods, like what's the five nearest restaurant to my location? Or rent rates. Within five miles radius, how many Uber cars I have? Okay? So how do we do that? We click on the map and give you an SQL query, by the way. So we extend the typical SQL syntax with uh, this query spot, like this one is a 10 years neighbor query. And then you run the queries. And it gets get results back. If I zoom in a little bit, uh, you can see the 10 years neighbor for this query. And what's interesting is you can analyze the query plan. It gives you the logical plan. And then it gives you an analyzed logical plan, so it's a slightly optimized version of that. Then you go through the current plan to give you an optimized logical plan. In this case, we are actually using an R tree index. R tree is something like B tree, but in high dimensional space. Okay. So initial plan is to do a linear scan. So how do you find nearest neighbors, by the way? The naive solution is to take the query point and compare that against each record in the database, calculate the distance sort all the record by the calculated distance and takes the top 10. That obviously is very expensive. Right? It's linear, the cost is linear to the number of records you have in the database. So if with 2.2 billion records, this will take quite some time. So instead of doing that, what we do is we optimize the plan and we realize the index and we generate this plan right here. And we can also do range queries. Very simple, you just you know, do this. And run the query. It will generate the SQL automatically for you, by the way. Okay, so if you change to a different query condition, or you can do that. Alternatively, you can do a much larger query range. That's a much larger query range, right? So in this case, we will actually return some samples of the output, because if you try to visualize the entire output, is too many points. So we generate a random sample of that and realize. So this will take a while because as you can imagine, with 2.2 billion records, there are so many records within this range. It's a huge range. So it takes some time, but even with that, we get the results very quickly. And you can see uh, the uh, generation of the curve. And behind the scene, remember, it's a cluster of commodity machines rather than a single node. So that's what we do here. What about in uh, Postgre SQL. So I have preloaded this Postgre SQL instance with a TPCH benchmark. The TPCH benchmark is is a standard benchmark people use to evaluate this performance. And um, here is the schema information for this benchmark. So it's used by many companies to test the performance of their database system. Right? So it's industry standard. Let me go all the way to the page with the schema. This is the schema for this, for this benchmark. So it has customers, orders, line item, and so on and so forth. Me. Like who has ordered what? So imagine this is kind of like an Amazon.com type of thing. Right? Who has ordered what from what region and what items? And then they give you a bunch of standard queries you want to run, and then whatever they pretty much like what we did in Lab 3. I give you some uh, database and some sample workload, and whoever runs the fastest uh, win the game. Right? 
So I've got a model wobbler course you have, which is this query right here, which is basically a joint between orders, customers, uh, lives, and so on and so forth. Looks fairly complicated, but essentially what it does is to tell you what's the revenue loss for all sales in a particular region, for all countries and customers from a particular region. In this case, I'm looking at the revenue loss, total revenue loss from the region of Asia. So that's like for China, Japan, Singapore, and all those countries, right? I look at my sales in those regions, I look at my last you know, uh, quarter or whatever time specimen there is, uh, uh, that mark has lost, and how, how, what's the total revenue loss for all the orders I have in that region. If you run this query, in uh, PostgreSQL, this query will take a while because this database is not a big database, but it's not smart either. So I generated the benchmark using skill factor about, I think about 100. So that gave me about 146 gigabytes of data. And this query will take about six to seven minutes to run. So I will cancel that. I will show you the size of the database. It's about 140 gigabytes. And I look at the table, these are the tables, right? Customer and so on. The follow match against this schema here. So what you want to know is what is the query plan generated by the engine for this. So what you do is So instead of executing the query, which will take a long time, what you do is you can explain the, the query plan. And this is the query plan generated. If you look at against the system I just demoed to you, it's actually similar, right? So if if you look at this output carefully, it's actually a tree-like structure. It's actually a tree-like structure. Essentially a tree. Like this. So this is the bottom of the tree, and that's the root. Okay. And the remaining part of this lecture, I will talk about how we actually can generate a query plan like this, okay? Using the query optimizer. And the same query optimizer, we can apply that principle to build PostgreSQL. We can apply that similar principle to build a in-memory spatial database like this. Okay? In-memory spatial. By the way, you may wonder what we can do with this system like this, right? Using a system like this, we can analyze a lot of interesting data. For example, we have been collecting a lot of Twitter data, a millions and millions of Twitter data with geotag information. And using a system like this, we can actually analyze things like This is another product we're working on right now. We use all the Twitter data we get, and using the system we have built, we can analyze by location and time what people are talking about on Twitch. So this is a timeline. For example, uh, we are analyzing the reaction people have uh, to different events in the election. And we can analyze which, based on the Twitter data we get, which state is winning, which party is winning which state. We can even go to county level, look at this county and come back, or uh, go to a particular state and look at what's the breakdown break on that county using the geotag tweet we have. And then we can even do this over a map to say, okay, if I'm interested in positive tweets about Republican, where those tweets are, using the system we have here. Okay? So, but in order to do all this, you really need to have a fairly deep understanding of query optimization and query evaluation inside the database engine, right? So that's what we're doing right now. So, so I, I basically fly you to 10,000 feet, but I now need to grab you down to the ground, right? So in order to do that, you know, flying to 10,000 feet is always good. Dream big is good. <coughs> you cannot dream always, right? So that's one problem I have with a lot of, you know, maybe that's the, you know, something tied with the education system here in the US. It's like you always are encouraged uh, to dream big, but at the end of the day, you need to uh, be grounded as well. In order to realize your dream, you cannot just dream big. You have to carry out the actions, right? So we need to understand how optimization is done in order to build all these uh, really nice systems. 
So here is what you need for a true optimization, right? A close, close set of operators. Uh, you know, close, I, I, I explained what I mean by closed in the beginning of the semester, right? So for example, we apply to the field of integer, multiplication is closed, but division is not. Meaning the output is something that you can describe using the same model as we input. So specifically, in our context, the closed set of operator essentially refer to the relational, uh, relational algebra of operators. Uh, you take relational instance at input, they produce relational instance at output. You need to understand plan space. That's essentially what we talked about earlier, plan equivalence. I will elaborate this a little bit more. Then you need some cost estimation model to estimate the cost of a particular plan. And then you need to have a search algorithm. Why do you need a search algorithm? The reason is, for typical queries, the plan space is huge. The plan space is huge. Why? If you consider a join as an example, Join is community and associated. Meaning A join B join C is equivalent to B join A join C or A join bracket B join C. Roughly speaking, if you consider all the possible plans for a join or multiple tables, you are really looking at a permutation of those tables. With the number of tables or number of join operators increase, that plan space grow exponentially rather than linearly because we are really talking about something in the order of a permutation. Do you follow me? So the plan space, and that's just consider the order of the join. If you couple that with the fact that each, even with a given order of a join, for each join operator, you also have many, many different join algorithms to choose from. The combination simply become, quickly become too big for you to consider all of them. So the plan space becomes too big to afford a linear scan of all possible plans. I mention this because that's why a search algorithm is important. Otherwise, if your plan space is small, forget about any search algorithm. Simply test each possible plan. And for each plan, you test the cost. You estimate the cost. You don't need any search space. You basically increase for all possible, of course, equivalent plans. But the reality is you are not able to afford to do that. The plan space is too, too big. So we do need a smart search algorithm in order to go through this huge plan space and only look at those promising ones rather than those you know, really expensive ones. You don't even look at that. You prune them away uh, early in your search space. So that's why we need a search algorithm as well. So those are the few things we need. Now we're going to look at how we do each one of them. Okay? Then at the end of the day, we're going to integrate all of them to derive the relational cross manner at the end of the lecture. Okay? So here's a quick summary. So I'm going to. So basically, this is the same thing as I already mentioned. So in particular, I'm going to look at what we call system R optimizer. To give you a little bit of background about system R. System R was a research project conducted by IBM Research in the early days of 80s, 1980s I'm talking about. So it's about 30-ish years ago. Uh, a group of people at IBM Research Amadan uh, embarked on this project called System R. Why System R? Because back then, you don't even have a commercial relation within the system. So they basically have something in mind that they're going to build a database system that's relational that's why we call this product System R. Okay, so that just give you some background. However, even though it's a very you know old product, thirty years old, uh, the principle they have explored basically survived this many years of database research, and the principle they use for curve mother in System R have been essentially adopted by most commercial database engines nowadays. So if you look at Oracle of uh, uh, MySQL, and even the things we have built here for fancy uh, uh, spatial database, uh, the, the optimizer we use adopt similar principles to those people have used in System R. Okay, so that's why we basically gonna assume this System R optimizer in our discussion. And here is some high-level 
set up right, high level uh, conditions. First of all, the cost estimation is a very inexact estimation. However, this very inexact estimation works okay in practice. Because if you think about the driving example I gave you at the beginning of this lecture, toward the end, yes, you can improve your query cost a little bit from 6,000 hours to about 4,000 hours and so on, so on and so forth. However, really the, the, the important message there is to avoid those expensive ones that started with 500,000 or 250,000 IOs. Once you are down in the space of a few thousand IOs, whether it's 3,000 or 4,000 doesn't really matter. Does that make sense? That being said, your cost estimation doesn't have to be exact. It can be a really rough estimation. For example, my exact IO cost might be 4,000, and your estimator tell me it's about 6,000. That's okay, because then, even with a rough estimation like this, you can tell this plan is better than another plan that has 500,000 IOs, exactly, but estimator may say it's about 500, 480k IOs. You can still tell the difference, that's my point. If the cost between two plans are hugely different. So the estimation doesn't have to be exact. Because the goal, remember, the goal is here is not to find the optimal plan. And people have shown that in order to find optimal plan, that problem is NPR. You can actually kind of guess this argument because I argue for you the plan space is roughly in the order of computation of this table, which is an exponential increase of value with respect to the number of relation participating in the drone. With that input, you cannot hope for, for a polynomial solution. So this problem of finding optimal plan is, right, is really an NP-hard problem. So in practice, what people do is design heuristics inside the database query optimizer. Instead of finding the optimal plan, my objective is simply to find a good enough plan. That's not too bad. It's really to avoid those bad plans. That's most what most optimizers end up doing. Okay? So combined with all these discussions, uh, in exact estimation is actually okay for our purposes. That's point number one. Point number two, when we estimate the cost of a curve plan, so far we have been concentrated on IO cost. We for the most part we have ignored the CPU cost. That's why These two plans make no difference to us. Even though we know the plan on the right hand side will be more efficient, much more efficient in practice, because they save you a lot of CPU cost. But in our model, if we focus only on the IO cost, these two plans have no cost whatsoever. Obviously, that's not right. A crowd model should be smart enough to distinguish the two and go with the plan on the right hand side rather than just make a random choice between the two. So, what the real system handle this is to design something called a cost model that establishes a rough equivalence between CPU cost and IO cost. For example, about 100 CPU instructions roughly equal to one random IO. Or 1,000 CPU instructions equal to one random IO. You, you establish a rough cost model for your system architecture, and you go with that. With that being said, you basically estimate the number of CPU instructions you need to execute for a particular plan, scale that by a factor in your cost model, and then combine that with your IO cost, derive a final combined cost as the cost estimation for your current plan. Does that make sense? And that being said, there will be a difference between the two plans I showed you earlier, because the plan on the right hand on the left hand side will have a much higher CPU cost, and that will be captured by uh, your, your model, your, by your cost model. Those CPU costs will be translated to I don't know how many IO costs. Okay. So you end up with a higher number on the left hand side than the plan on the right hand side. For simplicity though, for simplicity though, for this class, I'm gonna assume that that cost model of converting CPU instruction to equivalent IO cost exists. And that's a simple linear scale factor that you apply. I divide by 100 or divide by 1000 or whatever that is. And we're going to ignore that part. It's very easy to divide that, and we're going to ignore that part. So we focus on optimizing 
on a different plan with respect to only the I/O cost. Okay. With that being said, though, in your implementation later on in real system, you do need to incorporate the cost model for the CPU cost as well. Okay. Lastly, for the plant space, I'd argue for plant space, if you were to consider all the equipment and plants, it's simply too big. Because it's roughly something uh, in the order of the computation for the number of tables you have uh, in the joint operations. So it's too big. So in practice, what people do, people consider only what we call the lefty plants. I will show you what a lefty plant looks like. I will move forward quite a bit. Okay. So this is what we call a lefty plan. These are not. So what's the difference? By the way, they are all equivalent if you test them. Because drones are communitive and associative. So all these plans are equivalent. But in most system optimizers, they only consider what we call lefty plan and they ignore these plans because the plan space is simply too big. So what's a lefty plan officially was formally what's the definition for a lefty plan? Well, a lefty plan is a tray structure where at every level of your tray, the right hand side child is always a base relation. At every level of your tray, the left hand side child, sorry, the right hand side child is always a base relation. So let's check that against this. At every level, so in the first level, the right hand side is the base relation. At the second level, the right hand side is the base relation. At the third level, the right hand side is the base relation. That's not the case here. In this case, the second level, the right hand side is not a base relation, but an intermediate result. A joint between two base relations. Here, at the second level, the same thing can be said. So they are not left in free plans. Only this one is. But even if you consider only left in free plan, you still have many ways of joining them, right? You can flip the order. Or you can do C join D first before you do A join B. You still have many, many plans to consider, right? So it does reduce your search space dramatically, but still it's a huge search space. And we still need an efficient search algorithm to go through all different left tree plans in order to find a good one. At the end of the day, right? So we still need some discussion, even if we, we go with this assumption of only considering left left deep tree plans. Okay? Now let me come back. Okay, with that being said, uh, another note I'd like to have is to argue that remember at the beginning of the semester we talk about nested queries, right? nested queries, where you have nested blocks of SQL statements coming together to form a complex, more sophisticated SQL query for you, right? And some of you ask me the question then, which is, if I can write a query without using nested, loop, uh, nested blocks, should I do that, or should I go with the nested block approach? Well, my response then was, you should always try to write your query without using nested blocks. One of the fundamental reasons for that is in most database systems, in most database systems, the optimizer is not able to establish equivalence between a nested uh, query to an equivalent query without nesting, without nested block. It is a very hard problem. So what they end up doing is optimizing each block independently. end up doing is optimizing each block in the design. Consider this example. Consider this example. And this is the outer block. And this is the nested block. What the optimizer will do is I will optimize this inner block using a lefty tree plan search algorithm. I consider all the lefty tree plans for the inner block. In this case it doesn't even involve left deep tree plan because it's only a single table query. It's not even involving a join. So you consider all different options for executing this query. Then you stick with the best plan you find over there. Then assuming you look at this, what ultimately will do is look at this block and realize that that block simply returns a, const a constant. So the outer block, I will simply view that as But 
but it, it's a set of constant, right? Because it's a good back. So the auto block, I will basically view that as select name from series where age is in a set of constant. And I don't know what are the values for this constant, I don't know how these are generated. I will only opt I will basically optimize the auto block like if I'm optimizing a query as such. So basically you are optimizing the two blocks independently. Does that make sense? By looking at the structure of your next query. So by structure, I mean looking at this query, you realize the auto block is essentially a query with this particular structure. With a bunch of constants. In practice, however, oftentimes uh, you may be able to do better than this if you consider the correlations between the outer and inner block. Right? You might be able to find a better query plan than optimizing in the this way. That's why I said earlier again in today's lecture, if you have the users of your database system matter a lot. If you have a seven user, tech seven user. Uh, like you guys, and you start with an uh, SQL query that's fairly efficiently written, that will save a lot of costs for the curve, curve matters, uh, uh, for the database kernel, for, for these reasons. For these reasons okay? All right, so with that being said, we're going to use the same examples as our driving examples to go through uh, cross matters, go to cross matters. Okay, well, let's look at cross matters. So we will do this step by step. We will basically start with the uh, SQL query, look at the plan generated, and from that plan, we look at what happens at each step, and go all the way down to the core of the relational cross matter. Okay. So the first thing you do is you take the input SQL. By the way, before I start, I will just give you throw this off. That the overall workflow is so I don't have on this slide, but I do have on the other side. Uh, do I have? No, I don't have. Let me see. No, I don't have that. Okay, now I have. Well, it's in one of my papers. So I will add that to the slides. This is a typical workflow for uh, cross validation, right? You take SQL query as input, you go through a parser. Simple, it's our system, but you can rename that to whatever system you have, like Postgres parser. And then you use the catalog information to generate a, what we call a logical plan. And then you use that to generate a, what we call an optimized logical plan. And for that, we typically use something called loop based optimization. What do I mean by loop based optimization? Well, simple things like when you have a selection, you want to push down the selection operator. This always helps, no matter what kind of query structure you have. When you have a selection after the production, uh, sorry, after the join, you always push down the selection to do selection before you do the join. That always gonna happen. And this is a rule, right? It doesn't you apply this regardless of <coughs> what kind of query you have, what kind of data you have what distribution you have, you do this regardless. And that's why it's called rule-based optimization. And then you apply this rule-based optimization to get optimized logical plan. These are business secrets, by the way. Rule-based optimization are always business secrets. It's just like Google when they do their ranking. We all know Google use PageRank to do the ranking. But why Google still rank, give you better rank results than Bean and other search engines? Is because, yes, the underlying principle is the same, but over the years, because they get more data, because more people are using Google, they are able to derive more rule based optimizations. And these rule based optimizations are really the experience they have accumulated over multi years uh, of, of data accumulation. And so these are really business secrets for Google. 
and really hard for others to derive those rules without the amount and the scale of the data that Google has. Okay? And the same thing happening in database space. If you look at Oracle, the Oracle current engine, I don't know this for sure, but my friend working inside Oracle told me it has about 400 also optimization rules for their rule-based optimizers. Whereas if you look at MySQL or Postgres, they have about less than 100 optimization rules uh, in their rule-based optimization phase. That tells you the difference, right? That tells you the difference. And once you have an optimized logical plan, you go with what we call a physical plan. A physical plan basically is a plan with access method. Meaning, for this operator, I'm going to do a heat file scan. For this operator, I'm going to do an index scan, so on and so forth. And from physical scan, this is where you apply what we call CBO, uh, cost based optimization. Cost based optimization means that it is not something like rule based optimization you apply regardless of data. You do cost based, cost -based optimization using statistics you have attended for your data, so it might change from time to time. Even for the same query, I actually gave an example of cost based optimization last lecture, which is if you want to calculate the average income for all Salt Lake City populations uh, with a selection condition on age. <coughs> If you do an average income for age 20 to 25, and if you have an index, B tree index on the age attribute, obviously you will want to use that B tree index. But if I use the same query but change my search condition to age between 0 and 100, that B tree index might end up being an overhead for you compared to simply do a linear scan of your data. Because when you do selection from 0 to 100, age wise, you are basically looking at almost all the data anyway. B tree doesn't help you much. And, and in fact, if you use B tree, it might introduce an additional overhead of going down the tree. If I do linear sky, I can just go from the from the top directly. So even for the same query, you may end up with different physical plans. That's two different physical plans. Why? Because the access method is different. One is a, a B tree search, one is a heat file scan. Which one you want to go with? This is not something you can decide using a rule-based approach because it really depends on the actual cost of each access pass. And that's why it's called cost-based optimization. And the, you can only do that using some statistics you have maintained for your database. In this particular example I gave, you have to know the selectivity in order to decide which one you want to go with. Okay, so that's basically some examples uh, I want to talk about before I dive into all these details, okay? So we translate this query into something like this. So this is what's done by a parser. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. At least in this class, we, uh, uh, we do not teach how to do parser, but the basic principle behind constructing a SQL parser is no different from the parser you, you, you will build for C++ or any other programming language. You use the R and things like that. If you ever take a compiler class, you understand what I'm saying. So it's very standard parser that you will construct. Okay. You maintain a single table and so on so forth. Right? So uh, using those knowledge you have from a compiler class. Okay. Now, once you have an input curve plan to start with, the next step is to establish what we call relational equivalence so that you can generate equivalent plans using that plan generator. Right? So the next point I'm going to discuss is, is relational equivalence. So here are some basic relational equivalents. Right? So for selection, a selection with conjunctive normal form, this is what we talked about before. Right? This is the conjunctive normal form. As I argued before, any selection condition can be converted to a conjunctive normal form. So this is a very general representation of pretty much any selection condition you may encounter. Right? Anything can be converted to a conjunctive normal form. Once you have a conjunctive normal form, you can establish the following equivalence, which is doing a selection with a conjunctive normal form term is equivalent to doing multiple selections on each term one by one. And the order doesn't matter. You can swap the orders too. So that's very easy to argue, actually. So you can swap the order as well. 
Okay? So that's one relational equivalence. The other relational equivalence is about projection. Projecting out a single attribute or least of attribute, this A1 could be a least of attribute, doesn't have to be a single attribute, right? Is equivalent to doing multiple projections on multiple different attributes as long as each of the projections you have done before you do the final projection has content A1 in the projection list. Then it's okay. Then they are always equivalent. Then they are always equivalent. Well, Jones is cited by both associative and commutative properties, as I argued many, many times now. Okay. And there are more equivalents we can establish. For example, a projection commutes with a selection if that selection uses only attributes returned by the projection. And selection between attributes of two arguments of a cross product converts cross product to a join. What that essentially says is uh, we talk about this uh, uh, many times, right? Well, in relation to Okay? A theta join is what can be represented by a cross product with a selection uh, using that join attribute. A selection on just attributes of R commutes with R join S. So if you do a selection of R join S and you know that selection involves only attributes of R, you can push down that selection to R. Even if that selection involves condition on S, what you can do is break that selection into two parts and push down the two selections uh, to the two sides respectively, to R and S respectively. And similarly, a projection can be pushed through a, a join operator A you keep not only the projection attribute, but also the join attribute when you're pushing down that projection uh, operator. So, that equivalence actually is very easy to establish, right? You basically combine these rules, and each of these rules sounds very simple, but if you combine them, it's a combinatorial kind of problem, right? So you end up with many, many equivalent plans, as you can tell, right? So we can use this uh, equivalence test to test whether two given plans are equivalent or not. So the plan generator is fairly uh, easy to understand. Next, let's move on to uh, the hardest part, the really difficult part, which is the cost estimation. How do we estimate the cost of a plan uh, when you are given a plan? So when you mention the equivalent, does that mean cost would be equivalent? Well, the costs are not equivalent. Okay. Yeah. Where, when I mention equivalence, that really means the semantics of query are equivalent. Okay. So cost estimation. How do we estimate the cost of a query plan? Okay. So by the way, this part is the this, every year I teach this class, this is the part I, I, I hate the most because this part is really messy and it's not easy to explain. And it's probably boring for you guys to follow through. So I will try to do the best as I can to, to make it as clear as possible to you. I just, Plan optimization part. Right? This is my least favorite part in terms of teaching, but it's a really fascinating object uh, if you actually uh, work on this. Okay. So, what you need to do is really two things. Okay? We break this down, right? If, if you have a sophisticated plan like this, like this, this is like, if you give me a plan like this, ask me to optimize, you know, I, I kind of want to quit my job already. <laughs> My goodness, it's overwhelming and it's messy and, and, and you know it's, it's anything that you don't want to be associated with, right? Uh, so so how do you how do you optimize? How do you estimate the cost of this? Well, you do this step by step. You do this using uh, uh, two things, two machineries. One is yes, this whole plan looks really overwhelming. It's too much, right? So let's break down operator by operator. So the first operator is really an index selection with an index selection condition, then a heap scan, then a hash join, and so on and so forth, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ignore all the other things. I'm only going to look at, for example, this part, which is basically an index search operator. I, I can estimate the cost of this, right? If I know whether it's a class index or unclassified index, a hydro tree, 
And more important, I, if I know the selectivity of this condition, I can estimate the cost of this operator. Of course, you also need to know the input size. Does that make sense? You can estimate the cost of this. Similarly, you can pretty much say the same thing for each operator by itself. If you know the input size, some basic statistics about the structure you use, like hydrometry, cluster or uncluster, size of the heap bound, and selectivity. You can estimate each input by its own. At the end of the day, you simply combine them. If it's a join, you just look at what's the join algorithm uh, as one of the ones we discussed. If you, as long as you know the input size and the join algorithm and the buffer size, you can estimate the cost of the operator as well. Does that make sense? So the bottom line is, if you know the input size, if you know the the uh, the selectivity, if you know some basic statistics such as memory size, <coughs> index type, and index height, you can estimate the cost of any single plan operator. No matter how complicated the whole plan is, you can estimate every single operator in the in the plan. And then you can do this bottom up. You start with the plan operator at the bottom. You estimate the cost of that. Move move to the next operator in the next level of your tree and move upwards. Until you're done with the last operator, that's essentially the cost. You add up all the costs, that's the cost of your plan. The only trick is for the operator at the bottom, for these guys, input size is easy because input size is given to you. That's maintained by the Davis in the catalog. What about a plan right here? I mean, if I'm using a nice blue join, and my two inputs are some intermediate results as a result of output from the operator down below. I do not know the size of those output. In other words, I do not know the size of my input. Do you follow me? That's, that seems to be the only challenge left. Right? If we can resolve that puzzle, we can add up the whole thing. Do you follow me? Because if you know the output size, of any intermediate results, you cannot know the input size of any intermediate operator. They can estimate the cost of each operator one by one using the strategy I have just described. So it boils down to what? It boils down to estimating the size of the output. But that's the same as what? Selectivity estimation. If you can estimate the selectivity for any operator, knowing the input size, you can estimate the output size. And you can recursively apply this idea to estimate the size of any output anywhere in your query plan space. In other words, you can estimate the input size anywhere in your plan space. And that will give you the ability to estimate the cost of each operator. So the whole thing boils down to, like really complicated problem, boils down to selected estimation. Do you follow my argument? Right? So, so I will stop right here. Next lecture, we will talk about how we do selective estimation. And using, after that, the only thing left, we talk about plan equivalence, how to generate equivalent plans. We talk about how to estimate the cost of plan using this selective estimation idea. And what's the only thing remaining? A search algorithm. Then we, that could be the problem, right? So we will talk about those two things. Selective estimation and uh, search, uh, plan search algorithm. Thank you.